There we go. So, you guys know we're dealing with reincarnation this month. Are you so excited about it? Okay. You came back again. Well, if anybody, um, last week we laid the foundation for it. <laughs> I, I'm just not getting into it. <laughs> came back again. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Took me a minute. <laughs> All right, so um, last week we laid the foundation for it, so if you feel a little behind the energy, is, it, is everybody at least familiar with the concept? Oh, yeah. Nobody, okay, great, then I'm just gonna go on. <laughs> and if you need to watch, last week was good, so go ahead and watch that too, because that'll give you some foundation. All right, I'm gonna start with a scripture. I'm in the Aquarian Gospel, this is chapter 114. I read a little bit of this last week, but I wanna take it a little further. Jesus is talking, and people are saying to him, why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever asked that question? They're so, such a good person. Why did the bad thing happen? And Jesus says this. We cannot look upon a single span of life and judge anything. There is a law that man must understand. Results depend on cause. So if it results means we're having an experience. That means at some point in our life, a causal energy was created to allow that result to occur. Can you guys with me? So men are not motes to float about within the air of one short life and then be lost in nothingness. They are undying parts of the eternal whole that come and go many times upon the earth and to the great beyond to unfold the godlike self. We spoke about that last week. A cause may be part of one brief life. The results may not be noted until another. You guys with me? So why I'm having this experience may have been created in another time and space and I'm having it today. The cause of your results cannot be found within my life. What you are experiencing, you cannot blame me for. You had a cause that was created in your world in another lifetime that you brought forward to have this experience, okay? Nor, and I can't blame you, the cause of my life cannot be found in yours. I cannot reap except I sow, but I must reap whatever I sow. When men see no further than one little span of life, it is no wonder they say there is no God. If you would judge a right of human life, you must rise and stand upon the crest of time and note the thoughts and deeds of men as they have come through the ages of the past. We must know that man is not a creature made of clay to live and disappear. He is a part of the eternal whole. There never was a time when he was not, and a time will never come when he will not exist. Okay. So that sets up the um, understanding that most of the questions we have about somebody else's life or somebody else's behavior, we can't find the answer in our world, our culture, our upbringing. That is a unique individual soul choice that they have made. Whether we agree with it or not, it is a soul choice that they have made. So we need to take our eye and look on self. What is happening in my world? Who am I? What am I experiencing? And how might I um, shift a little bit? So we're talking about um, cause and effect, and then we're going to move into karma. So cause and effect is when you put something into motion, it returns to you in like kind. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. If you are unkind to someone, someone will be unkind to you. That's, that's cause and effect. Your energy and intention and action, I'm trying to make it simple. You put it out, it'll return to you. I'm going to slap her down. Well, somebody's going to slap me down. Do you see what I'm saying? And sometimes we say, I'm going to do it anyway because I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm going to play in this energy. You know, but, but realize as long as I am good at doing it and I'm enjoying doing it, it's going to return to me. And then if I choose to put it out again, it'll return to me again. This is the, the energy that we, when it returns, we need to decide are we comfortable with it or are we not comfortable with it. And there will come a point where we'll become uncomfortable. I get tired of getting smacked. The minute we don't change our behavior then, if we decide I'm going to, I must be bad because I'm getting smacked, I must be, it, the minute we attach a judgment to the act, we now go into what is called karma. Karma is when a pattern repeats because you have judged it. Because you can stop the smacking at any point. I'm done with it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Then it doesn't happen to you. Do you see? Cause and effect. But when we judge it, we anchor it in and it becomes a pattern in our world. 
So we look, need to look at our lives and decide, is this valuable or is this uncomfortable for me? Is this, uh, what I'm experiencing, valuable or uncomfortable? And we choose again. When we send the pattern back out, it, when we send the energy back out, it creates the pattern we just spoke about, and it can recreate discomfort that will eventually create a block in your soul. The universe speaks in comfort and discomfort. Discomfort means there's a lock of energy somewhere in your, bi in your biology, in your consciousness. You guys understand? Okay. Comfort, we're flowing. Everything's flowing openly. All right. Judgment is about the effect. So let me give you two ways of judging. These are two opposites, but hopefully within these you'll be able to, polarities, you'll be able, they're, they're polarities of a thought. In the middle, you'll find yourself. So I have an experience on the earth plane, and dang it, I am right. I have authority and dominion, and you need to do what I say. So I am judging myself as being all that, and I'm judging you as being not that. And everything that I do, I'm setting up a pattern that, of course, I'm right. They need to listen to me. What's going to come back to me? Somebody dominating me. Someone needing to dominate me. Someone needing to tell me I'm wrong. And what do I do? I buck up. Oh, hell no. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's what you say when you buck up, OK? <laughs> I was in character. OK. <laughs> You buck up and you send it back again. Oh, no, I'm right. And I'm going to dominate. And so do you see how the thought of needing to be right, the needing to dominate, is our faulty thought that sets up the pattern that continues to bring forth discomfort? Got it? Okay. So something happens to me. I'm uncomfortable. And I have the thought, oh, I must be terrible. Oh, I must be terrible. Something wrong with me. Oh, my God, I'm terrible. I deserve this. I must have done something wrong. You hear? So I'm putting up the thought that has a victim and punishment consciousness to it when something happens. Now, what am I going to draw to myself? People that will make me feel like a victim and that I need to be punished. And then this energy, because there's a judgment attached to it, takes traction. And every person who wants to beat somebody up will come into my door. I need to dominate. I'm going to pick on you. OK, and I will feel like a victim. You see, karma is the perpetuation of experiences based on a judgment we have of a cause that we literally sent out. And we're caught in a loop. Is that easy to understand? OK. Karmic patterns lock in our choices, and we repeat until we learn. You with me? OK. When we learn, then we can release and choose again. So many of us are doing karma where we need to set something right, something that we've done in other incarnations. Um, some of us are aware of it. Some of us are not. Let me share this with you. This may be helpful. Spirit asked me to share this with you. I've been doing readings for 30 plus years, 35 almost 40. I used to do them when I was a kid. I'm not counting those years. But professionally, I've been at it for a really long time. So this is what I see when I read people. There's two types of people. Well, not, again, these are polarities of an experience. There is a type of person who has this beautiful, wide path of their life journey. It's huge. And they get to have anything they want. And they can go over here, and they can sit in the lollipop land for a little while, and nobody will yell at them. Or they can go over here, and they can jump out of airplanes, and nobody bothers them. Or they can do this. And it's just huge opportunities that they have to do whatever they want. The life path is full of distractions. It's full of fun. It's full of challenges. Oh, I can stay in this unhappy relationship as long as I want. Yay! You know. <laughs> It's full of choice. And then we have a life path that's very narrow with the other polarity. Very narrow life path. And it's almost like boom, 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 boom. You got no choices. Boom, 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 boom. You're going to stay in these parameters, and that's the way it's going to be, kid. And you feel like that was my life path, y'all. You know, there's like... Yeah, you're reading the Bible at 11. Yeah, you're studying religions. Yes, you're learning astrology in high school. Yes, you're doing all these things, you know, because you have work to do, and we don't have time for you to mess around. You see? When you're in that narrow life path, sometimes you feel a little bit jealous of the broad guys. Man, I didn't get to go jump out of an airplane. 
man, I didn't get to go stay in lollipop land for a long time. Do you hear what I'm saying? And you're so, mm, yeah. I didn't even get to get a good tan. <laughs> That's the truth. I was so busy working, you know? Which one are you? Are you somewhere in between? The people that come on the narrow band, they have already chosen. Your higher self has already said, okay, we're planning this lifetime, kiddo. You got things to do, things to accomplish, and it's your turn to show up. You don't get to pick, you don't get to lollygag, you gotta pay attention and you gotta get it done. So here you go. Bounce on the edges if you want, you're just gonna hurt yourself. Because <laughs> we are on forward motion. This is your lifetime to contribute in a way that will make you happy. It'll make you joyful, it'll make you fabulous, do you see? A lot of the people that are on the wider path, some of them may be masters having accomplished all things, but for most of them, they're people that do not know what their higher self wants them to do. They come in with this beautiful sense of awareness and what they tell me all the time is, I don't know what my purpose is. Whereas narrow path people, I don't care what my purpose is, I got work to do. <laughs> you know, we may not know what we're doing, but we're doing it. We're showing up and we're showing up every single day. Do you see? Wide path, the whole, one of the whole reasons for creating the wide path journey is so that you get to choose what you're working on. Do you wanna work on that karma? Oh, maybe you wanna work on this karma. You wanna rest for a while, that's okay. Go to the plateau. Hang out for a while. You want to have some more kids? That's fine. We can change your life path. You can do that. Do you see? You are getting the choice of choosing because you need to learn how to choose. You need to learn how to choose, what brings comfort, what brings discomfort. And when you learn that, you learn how to connect with the divinity within you. Because when you start choosing from the inner, the, the divinity connects. And guess what happens to your life path? It narrows, not as tight as mine, but it narrows. It narrows to say, okay, what's your next step? What do you wanna do next? What do you want to heal within your soul next? You guys with me? Is everybody totally comfor comfortable with a pictorial? Do you know where you are on the screen? Okay, all right. So narrow path people, hmm. Sometimes it's hard. Why can't I be the, like normal? <laughs> Yeah, you're not, <laughs> keep working. <laughs> All right, narrow path people feel focused and sometimes they too feel they have no choice, but they have already chosen. Do you understand? They've already made their choice. These people have chosen the path of a focused lifetime and they will be healing and contributing in a way that they've already agreed to, their higher self is with them and the connection to the vine is normally very clear. I don't know why, but I am. And whatever conditions you find yourself in, the higher self is defining you. The broader path, we're learning to choose. We're learning to choose. And some of us may bounce back and forth. You know, I'm trying to make something simple out of something that's very complicated. In Jesus Teacher Healer, one of my favorite books that I sleep on, Jesus is, or this is channeled by White Eagle. He's talking about reincarnation. Every soul chooses to come. You're never forced. Your higher self creates an energy that will allow you to gain experiences to develop qualities of God consciousness. That's our goal, is to unfold the godlike self. So it says that you may choose interesting situations. It may even be that the soul sees that by incarnating in a certain family, the family that it might need to help it develop the culture it needs to accomplish what it needs to do, Incarnating in that family, it may be liable to a certain problem of health because the tendency toward disease or disability will be transmitted to the soul in utero. So the soul will be told, you can enter that life, you can tackle that problem and see if you can rise above it. It is not necessary for you to suffer if you bring into operation the law of love. Now, you could not be born into a family with those tendencies of dis-ease and ill health unless there was some sympathetic vibration you also had toward it. 
um, they say disease of um, what diabetes is the inability to uh, process and uh, take in the joys of your life. Yeah, I kind of have that. Yeah, my diabetic mom will be fine. Do you see what I'm saying? So I don't want to manifest it, but there is a complementary vibration that allows me to be held in it. They're talking about transmuting karma. So the soul can take on the earth, it can get caught up in the energy, and it will can follow through with the DNA of the parental energies. But should the soul take the other path, opening its consciousness to the true God life and bring into operation, bring that into operation, it makes a jump, so to speak. It is possible for the inflow of the divine life from the higher self or temple of the heavens to shine so strongly in the physical body that all weaknesses given to you by your so-called heritage passes away. So even though we're born into it doesn't mean we have to become it. Now, when you are my age, I'm not sure about you guys, uh, but I know the questionnaires that I have to fill out now if I go for an eye doctor visit or whatever. You know, you're required to have a primary care person just on your record. There's a question that always says, um, do you have these diseases in your family? And now the question says, how did your parents die? I don't know. I think they reserve that for the elders. <laughs> so you have to list how your parents died, how your family, my brother died, my sister died, my mom died, my dad died. They need to add one more question to that questionnaire. Do you think like your parents? Because if you do not think like your parents, the direct association is no longer there. If you think like your parents, then those t tendencies may well still be in the DNA. But do you think like your parents? I don't think like my brother. I don't think like my sister. I don't think like my parents. My trajectory will be different because of that. When we allow divinity to enter into whatever we have chosen to experience in this lifetime, pre tight path, wide path, when we allow divinity to enter in, it can rewrite those scripts instantly. It can rewrite everything instantly. And you know how you heal karma? You should just change your brain. You wake up and say, I do not choose this any longer. I realize I'm a part of this. I realize the discomfort I'm feeling is my responsibility. Do anybody married ever? And you go, you. And they go, you. And you go, no, you. And they go, you. And then you have to realize that as long as I'm saying I'm uncomfortable, it's in me. It's in me. No matter how tricksy we get with it, and we can get pretty tricksy with it, <laughs> it's me. So I have to do something to heal what's within me, to heal a karmic pattern, to heal a thought, to heal something. And there, you know, metaphysics teaches all the time, we tend to marry the same person over and over again. Multiple marriages, same person, different name. The patterns are still cooking, and the patterns are likely karmic. There's a belief you have about yourself that reproduces when you go into relationships. You can be perfect before you go into a relationship and then it reproduces. Holding the idea the divine can enter into who I am and I can choose again. And the only realization you really need to have is you, do you need to go back to causal thought? Some of us do, but you don't always have to. You need to come to the fact that I can choose again. Whatever I did to choose this, I don't care what it was. I'm forgiven it, and I'm going to choose again because it's no longer how I want to learn. I don't want to learn this way anymore. I want to learn through love. I want to learn through life. I want to learn through love. You guys getting it? Okay. All right, there was one, uh, I will go quickly, one beautiful story I wanted to share with you guys. This is the blind man. It's in the Aquarian 138, and it is marked. Thank you, God. All right, I will paraphrase most of this. Jesus and the disciples are entering the city of Jerusalem, and you know, they did a lot of healing work there. They enter in, and as they walk along the path, they saw a man who was blind from birth. Peter said to Jesus, question, Lord, if disease and imperfections are caused by sin, who was this? And sin means we chose something that didn't support our life force. 
life force. Sin missing the mark, you'll understand that. This man, who was the sinner? The man or his parents? Peter is acknowledging that there is past lives because the man was born blind. He had to have done something before to come this way. And then this is what Jesus says. Affliction are, par are partial debts, partial payments of a debt that has been made. So he goes on to say, Affliction is a prison cell in which a man may stay until his, he pays his debts. A man stays in affliction, which is a limited perception based on his own choices, based on his activities, based on his perceptions, his beliefs. We, we tighten ourselves up. Unless a master sets him free so he may have a better chance to pay his debt. This man, once in another life, was cruel and in a cruel way destroyed the eyes of one a fellow man. The parents of this man once turned their faces on a blind man and helpless man and drove him from their door. So we have the resonance, the parents dislike and turning away from the blind man, the man needing to be born blind because he took the side of another. That's cause and effect, see? But there's some karma going on here too. Then Peter said, when do we pay the debts of other men when we heal them? And Jesus said this, because they heal people all the time, right? And Jesus would say, go and sin no more. We cannot pay the debts of any man, but by the word we may release a man from his afflictions and distress, make him free that he may pay the debt he owes by giving up his life in willing sacrifice for men or other living things. And then he goes to the man and said, would you receive your sight? And the man said, I, all I have I would give freely if I could see. And this is when he took, takes the clay, spits on the clay, puts it on the man's eyes, has him literally go to the water, wash his face, and say, Jehovahe, seven times. This is a very specific healing. The man had to walk in faith to do each of these steps. It wasn't one that was instant. It was like, okay, dude, you say you want it. I need to know you want it. Here you go. And the guy was healed. So the guy was healed, and the, um, so everybody was shocked. This man's blind from birth. The priests get involved. You know the priests have an opinion, and they do not like people being healed this way. And so it is Sunday. It's the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. You can't heal on the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. So they bring the man in, and they say, who healed you? And he said, I don't know. They call him Jesus. He's from Galilee. And the, the priests say, this is not possible. And they bring in his parents. They testify he was blind at birth. But we don't know who that man was. We do not know who that man was because they were afraid of the priests. They did not want to lose their status in the church because the church was the government and the church was life. And the church, the people of the church, had been feeding this man money this whole time to keep him alive. I mean, that, the blind man, he was reliant on that whole community. They said to him again, who is he? Who do you think he is? And he says... This Jesus may be sinner or saint, I don't know. But this one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. And then they yelled at him and said, you're a follower of him. And he said, it is a marvel that you know not who he is, yet he opened my eyes. You know that nothing but the power of God can do such a thing. God does not hear the sinner's prayer, their belief, but you must know he is not wicked. He is not a wicked man who can use the energy of God in this way. Then they yelled at him. And they kicked him out of the synagogue. And when they cast him from the synagogue, he lost his standing in the faith. So he was now outcast. So what did the man do? He had taken someone's sight. He lost his sight, cause and effect. When the time came for him to be healed, he accepted the healing. And he could see. But the rubber didn't meet the road until he stood in his truth at the synagogue and said, I don't care what you say. I know who I am. I see very clearly. I see clearly this man has to be a man of God. I don't care what you say. As he's getting cast out from the synagogue, he's losing all livelihood. He's losing all identity. He's losing everything because now he is no longer acceptable to their cultural society. But he stood with his eyes open and he spoke the truth to the Pharisees and the priests. He told them clearly what he saw. This is the only time that we see Jesus seeking somebody out after a healing. And Jesus sought him out and said to him, 
you know, I, he knew what the guy just went through. And he knew the guy was standing strong. The guy was seeing clearly. And Jesus said to him, uh, he told him that he was the son of God. And the, the guy said, well, there's only one son of God? And Jesus said, no, every man is son of God. Every man can choose to be son of God. And this man, through the conversation, I know, began to teach the clarity of God's love flowing on this earth plane. So this man began to be a teacher, follower, whatever, of this new knowledge that he had, all men are sons of God by faith. So what is he doing but opening eyes? The cause, the effect, and the karma is being healed by opening the eyes of his world. Do you see? We may have to go and do some stuff that might not have been on our trajectory or, or to make up for what we've done. We may have to do stuff to make up for what we've done. You know, I've told you guys a million times, I know, I remember being a part of a, a communal group of hierarchy in the Catholic Church many years ago when it was decided not to let the little plebeians read the scripture because they wouldn't understand it. And I voted yes to not let that happen. I voted to let that, that I was in agreement with them that they should not, it should be sacred, it should be holy. Do you hear what I'm saying? How many subsequent lifetimes have I had to teach? <laughs> a lot. A lot. I've had to come back and teach scripture to people. That's why people will say, please don't teach the Bible anymore. I have to. <laughs> you don't understand. I love this stuff. I can show you the metaphysics of it all. <laughs> I have to teach it. You see? And it writes what I did. And I've probably overdone it. Truth be told. <laughs> but are you with me? Yeah. All right. So when he yielded to Jesus in trust, he opened up the connection to his divine, his I am, his higher self. Healing occurred. When he defended Jesus and said, no, you will not take my sight from me again. And I'm going to help you with your sight. He took up his mission. And that's the space where we feel the freedom to be who we are. When we're, karma is not something to be afraid of, it's something to work with, to move through, to open up, to choose again. Just choose again. If you see a repeated pattern and you can't source it, choose again. And choose at the depth of your soul, through your higher self, that I can do this differently. I can do it through giving, I can do it through laughing, I can do, I could write music, I could do anything to heal this within me. You guys got it? All right. So choosing is choosing sets your cause in motion. Judgment, which is choosing, sets your karma in motion. Choosing is your free will. And the service is about karma and free will. You never lose your free will, ever, ever. It's a part of you. Easy, huh? Did I make your life so simple today? <laughs> All right, let's go within. Let's anchor this. Let's just breathe. Just begin to see a beautiful column of light come over you and feel that beautiful love of God just filling you to overflowing. Imagine that you can just sense that garden in your heart, the beautiful space within your heart center that you're always safe. And if you will, imagine with me that you can step into the beautiful energies. And in your heart, you say this internally, you don't have to say it out loud. If you can, I would l encourage you Open up your arms, throw your hands into the air, and say, I love my soul. I love who I am. I love all I have ever been and all I am becoming. And it 
is good. Feel the energy growing around you. Feel your heart chakra opening even more. Feel the love of Father, Mother, God for you. For every time you did anything, every time you invested yourself in this earth plane for joy or challenge, God loved you. You are here to unfold your godlike self. One more time, take a breath and just say, I love my soul. I love you, soul. I love my soul. I am good. Feel the light surrounding you and very gently let your focus come back to the physical body. Just feel God. I will choose again. But for now, take a breath. You can gently open your eyes. Was there any soul yelling out there? <laughs> Some are quiet. Be with what we've talked about today. It's one of the premises of our soul construct. Um, again, it's simplified. You're very complicated. And we could match this. What we spoke of today could be matched into many paradigms of postulations of who we really are because this is how we read it on this earth plane. Say, yay, God. Yay, God. Thank you.